Right, I'm going to be continuing where I left off last time I didn't finish. Remember, we're looking at um, the book of Revelation in specific chapters 2 and 3, and we've had a bit of a diversion in that we focused not so much on the churches literally that Jesus spoke to, but how they represent seven periods in church history, and also the amazing correlation that there is between these seven church ages and the seven parables of the kingdom that Jesus gives in Matthew 13. So remember we saw the gospel goes out during the first age of the church, represented by the church of Ephesus. Then Smyrna, the persecuted church, this terrible persecution that was in this period as well by the Roman emperors, the pagan Roman emperors. emperors. Then we saw in the third age, the state church, when the first Christian emperor, uh, Constantine legalized Christianity, and we see the church growing as Jesus, I believe, predicted in his third parable, like a small mustard seed, insignificant, and yet it grows and fills the world. And we're busy at the moment with the third age, Thyatira, approximately AD 600 to 1500, the papal church, where the church was no longer just the state church, but where we see this incredible power of the popes as the Roman Empire in the West uh, declined and uh, only the Byzantine Empire remained in the, uh, in the East. And so the popes got this power, a lot of um, temporal power as well. But we also saw the leaven, and that's what we were focusing on in particular. So when Jesus spoke to the church at Thyatira in the Roman province of Asia, he rebuked them because they allowed false teaching, remember? by a self-appointed prophetess whom he calls Jezebel. And he said to them, despite the fact that he had some good to say, he said, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. So sexual immorality, idolatry in this church because of the influence of this false prophetess. And so we see as well a lot of heresy coming into the church in this period, the age that it's typical. In particular, we see the gospel of grace has been corrupted and salvation by faith alone, where Christianity is almost reduced to a works-based religion. And so I believe that this is one of the things Jesus spoke about when he talked about the leaven. Remember leaven spreads through the whole dough. It says in Galatians 5 verse 9, and those of you who cook will know, it takes just a little leaven to spread right throughout the dough. And leaven in Scripture always has a negative connotation, despite the fact that some people try to see this in a positive light and say, well, this is the spread of the church consistent with the mustard seed that went before. No, leaven is bad. It represents false teaching, hypocrisy. And we saw how the leaven of the Sadducees was the fact that they were so politically involved at the time of Jesus, they were more worried about the politics and pleasing the Romans and collaboration than the preaching of the true word of God. And so the church too had got very much involved in politics and political influence and even gained territory, the papal states in Italy. Some of it even through, as we saw, forgery. We've been looking at the leaven of the Pharisees and the Pharisees, we saw, they emphasized tradition over the word of God. Jesus said to them, you've let go of the commands of God and are holding on to the traditions of men. And this is what was happening in the church this time, where because of the fact that, as we saw, scripture was no longer available in the common language. Originally, it was in Greek, which everybody understood. When people started speaking Latin more predominantly, Jerome had translated the Bible into Latin. But after that, when Latin fell out of use, it was no longer allowable or it was frowned upon to translate the Bible into the vernacular. And so people no longer understood the word of God and they relied on sometimes corrupt leaders to tell them what it said. And so tradition took root as well. The sayings of popes and councils came to have equal authority to scripture. If the church leadership said it, they took it as being the same as the authority of scripture and so we were looking at the fact that we have this works-based religion developing 
where people believe that they have to not rely on the blood of Jesus and on confession to God alone, but on this whole system where you have priestcraft. And we got a, what was uh, we call a sacramental view of Christianity that developed. This is the same view that is still held by certain churches today. And it was developed in the 12th century by a theologian called Peter Lombard. And he said there were seven sacraments. A sacrament was something that was believed that could impart God's grace. One was baptism, then confirmation, the Eucharist, penance, extreme unction, holy orders, and matrimony or marriage. So all of these, it was believed, were vehicles by which the church could impart God's grace. So baptism gave grace for the remission of original sin. You weren't forgiven when you just asked for forgiveness. You actually had to be baptized, and the water washed your sins away, literally. Confirmation was the deepening of this grace when you confirmed that you understood what had happened to you as a child. The Eucharist, and we're going to have the communion afterwards because we're going to touch on this quite a bit, but where they believe that the Eucharist or the communion, as we normally call it, um, was actually for the forgiveness of venial sins. It was not just a symbol. By actually partaking of it, your venial sins were forgiven. Penance, which we dwelt on last time, where you had to confess to a priest, remission of eternal punishment due to mortal sins. Extreme unction was another way of talking about anointing of the sick, forgiveness of sins if the person was unable to obtain it through penance. Holy orders, that's where people were appointed into service as a priest or a deacon or a bishop, special grace there, and matrimony, the grace to love each other as Christ loves the church. So this was this sacramental way of looking at Christianity. And so with the idea of baptismal regeneration, which they believed in, they said that Water baptism was essential for salvation, that the baptism actually washed away your sins. And so if you didn't get baptized, you weren't saved. And that's why people, if they hadn't been baptized, would sometimes want to be baptized on their deathbed. That's why they started baptizing babies. What if the baby died before it was baptized? Because they believed that you had to be baptized, that baptism, the physical water washed away your sins. And they would use verses like this initially. Um, Acts 22 verse 16 get up be baptized that's what Ananias says to Paul and wash your sins away calling on his name so they saw the wash your sins away as being linked to baptized the reality is wash your sins away calling on his name it's the calling on his name that washes your sins away because you have to look at scripture in totality you can't take one verse out of context and base your doctrine on that and you'll find nowhere else in the Bible where it links your salvation to being baptized. It talks about confessing your sins, salvation by grace, faith. But now what happened if you sinned after you were baptized? So now I've washed all my sins away and I go out and I sin again. Well, I can't get baptized again. So there had to be a system that provided for the sin after you were baptized. And that's where we got this absolution of forgiveness where you had to as we saw um, the system developed and uh, sins were classified as venial which were not so serious or mortal was a really serious sin for the less serious ones you could just pray or do an act of contrition or take communion because remember communion gave you grace and mortal sins on the other hand had to be confessed to a priest and you had to confess at least once a year and it was believed that the priests had the authority to forgive sins Take in john 20 verse 23 where jesus said to his disciples if you forgive anyone's sins their sins are forgiven if you do not forgive them they're not forgiven so once again on its own it sounds like that's what it's saying but you have to look at the totality of scripture and that's why we find that Protestants interpret that to be the pronouncement of forgiveness of sin that is part of the gospel message. But I pointed out that it actually, more correctly, is addressing church leadership. And there are certain sins, not all sins, that it is in the authority of the church leadership to forgive. 
So at the Latran Council in 1215, they decreed that all persons had to confess at least once a year, and if you didn't, you possibly could be excommunicated. Once again, these traditions coming in with no basis for Scripture. Not only did you have to confess, and then you'd be absolved of your sins, but then you were given a penance. And that would typically involve some sort of good work. You'd either have to say some prayer a whole lot of times, and uh, the other things that you could do would possibly be fasting or giving alms, or voluntary self-denial. The reason I put that picture there, and this is the more extreme, uh, extreme case, uh, it wasn't the common practice. There are even some who used to whip themselves. It was called flagellation. They'd walk around with whips as penance for their sin. And they were obviously under terrible uh, conviction of sin. And these guys somehow thought that Christianity involved walking around with a whip and whacking yourself over the back the whole day because you're a sinner and inflicting pain on yourself. But biblical repentance, we saw, is reviewing your past feeling regret, and making a commitment to change for the better, and Jesus washing away our sin. We don't have to pay for it by physically punishing ourselves. It goes against the gospel. There's no biblical mandate for you to confess to an earthly priest. Priesthood was not carried through to the new covenant. It's not in the New Testament. The only priest there is Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, you had all these priests, and they were the mediators, and you used to go to the priest and offer your sacrifice, but we are told that in the New Testament, we have a high priest who offered a sacrifice once, and he didn't have to repeatedly sacrifice it. He's our high priest, the only one we need to approach. And it says in Hebrews 4, we do not have a high priest, like in the Old Testament, who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted just as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's how you find grace, not through following a sacramental system, but by going to our high priest who was sinless and who paid the price for our sin and offered himself as a sacrifice to God on our behalf. And so we can confess our sins directly to a priest, but that priest is Jesus, our high priest. He is our representative to the Father. He is the only mediator, we are told, between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. 1 John 2 verse 1 says, if you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. Who is it? Not the priest on earth, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who is at the right hand of the Father. And so you can obtain forgiveness without any good work, because the good work has been done already by Jesus. Yes, good works follow once you are saved. They are fruit, they are not the root of salvation. We hold, Paul says in Romans 3 verse 28, that one is justified by faith apart from works of law. You don't have to do any works to be justified. And so we saw last time that if you look at Scripture in totality, not try to take one verse here and one verse there out of context, look at the whole of Scripture, there's three types of confession. There's private confession, where if you've sinned in private, you need only confess to God and ask his forgiveness. You don't need to have public confession. If you have sinned publicly, then you need to confess publicly. So, for example, if the whole church is aware of your sin, then you need to confess publicly. And that is, is in that particular domain that I believe that when Jesus speaks to the church leaders and says you have authority to forgive sins, you can't forgive sins that were committed against someone else. And then we are told that we can confess to one another when you've sinned against that person. And Jesus spoke about this, about your brother coming to you and asking for forgiveness. Um, and you are to forgive them and also to request forgiveness as well. Now, the other thing that popped up at this time, and it took a bit of time, was the teaching about purgatory that evolved. And so allegedly this was a place of temporary suffering. It was for Christians, so Christians who weren't quite good enough to go into heaven, so they still had to pay off or work off some of their sin, and so they couldn't go straight to heaven, and they'd have to go to this temporary place called purgatory. Initially the term wasn't even used. Uh, it was a much 
later term that came into usage, but it, you can see how it developed over time, this idea, because of the system of the fact that you somehow have to pay penance for your sins. So the idea was that if you died and you had unconfessed mortal sins, remember those are the bad ones, you went straight to hell. Purgatory wasn't an option then. If your sins had all been confessed and you'd done all your um, penance, before you died, you'd go straight to heaven. It was the option for only a few, like, you know, the saints. Most people still needed purification when they died, so it was taught that, that they had to go to this place called purgatory, which is never mentioned in the Bible. And then once you'd suffered a bit there and your soul was purified, you could then go to heaven. Where is it in Scripture? Well, it's not in Scripture. If you can find it in Scripture, please come show me. Not there. Then it was also taught that the living could render assistance to the dead by praying for them and by giving alms. This idea that you could pray for someone once they had died and even give alms and it would somehow benefit them. And I've given the scripture, uh, not the scriptures there, the references there, so you can kind of see how it developed. I'm not going to read them all because we don't have the time, but that was the general idea of what I've summarized there at the top. And actually in 1274 at the Council of Lyon, the Catholic Church officially, for the first time, actually defined this doctrine of purgatory. And so here we see these two elements. They said some souls are cleansed, after death, by purgatorial, there you can see the, the, the word coming into use, or purifying punishments. To relieve punishments of this kind, the offerings of the living faithful are of advantage to these, namely the sacrifice of masses, prayers, alms, and other duties of piety. That's where you can now pray for people who did and maybe give some alms, and it will benefit them. And this is still believed in certain churches. And the support they claim from it, uh, for it is from a book that's not uh, in the Protestant canon, 2 Maccabees. And in 2 Maccabees, which is an apocryphal book, it's an interesting book, uh, both 1 and 2 Maccabees, historically, uh, it didn't claim to be inspired. It records events that happened between the close of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament, when the Israelites were under Greek rule. But there's an event, uh, you know, described there where Judah Maccabee, this, this uh, wonderful leader who rose up against the, you know, the, the, the Greeks and, um, you know, liberated uh, uh, Israel and Jerusalem and the temple. But he and his men pray for their fallen comrades. They discovered these men who had died in battle were carrying idols and they, it was against Jewish law. And so what they did after these guys were dead, they actually pray for them, ask that their sins be forgiven. Based on that passage, people today will still try to claim support for prayer for the dead and that you can benefit the dead. Maccabees is apocryphal, according to Protestants and Jews. The Jews never considered it to be in fact, it was only officially added into the Latin Vulgate Bible um, at the time of the Reformation because they needed it to try to prove that they had some sort of authority for this idea of purgatory, which is not in Scripture. Even there, it doesn't specifically mention purgatory. It's this idea of praying for the dead. Another thing that I believe is clutching at straws that they try to use is where Paul remarks about a man called Anisiphorus, and they say, well, he's actually praying for this guy and he's dead. There's nothing here that explicitly says he's dead. And so Paul says in 2 Timothy 1, verse 16 to 18, may the Lord show mercy to the household of Anisiphorus. So the claim is, why are they speaking to his household and not him? The guy must be dead. Because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. May the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord in that day, which is a reference to the judgment day. So the argument is, well, you see this guy's dead and Paul's actually praying for him, according to him. But I had a look at all the early Greek writers and not one of them believed that that's what that passage was saying. Nobody believed that Anisiphorus was dead. They mentioned in the Sephorus and nobody made that claim or used it. It was a later argument that was brought in. All the passage tells us is that Anisiphorus was not with his family in Ephesus. So when Paul 
sends greetings later on as well, and he says to the household of Anastasiporus, well, Anastasiporus was possibly not there. He was an itinerant, itinerant preacher all the way. Is there any merit in praying for the dead? Not a biblical concept. The time to pray for people is when they're still alive and with you. The time to speak to them about their salvation is while they still have breath. You can pray for them as much as you want to after they've died. It's not going to help because the Bible teaches Jesus in Luke 16 speaks about two men, Lazarus and the rich man. And what happens is there's no intermediate place. When they die, they don't go to purgatory. The one goes to hell, the other goes to paradise. And we find that the man who's in hell remembers his rejection of the gospel, he's in torment, and he is aware that his condition cannot be remedied. In fact, he asks for his brothers that are still living, because that's the only time you can change. It's too late once you've died. And so the doctrine of purgatory, which came up later, they tried to get scriptural support because later on they were questioned as to well, where is this supported in scripture. And so the verse that they would try applying as told you today is this one in 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 15. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, the foundation is Jesus Christ. Wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what, he has, uh, if what is being built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though as one escaping through flames. So they said that was a reference to the fact that some people don't go straight to heaven, and they actually have to have a bit of fire before they can go into heaven. Now, Paul speaking about the day, the day is the judgment day. It's a reference to the beam of judgment of Christ. This is speaking about the fact that if you've accepted the Lord, you will be saved, but you are also judged on your works, not as to whether you go to heaven or hell, but for reward. And the Bible teaches, if you read the full scripture, that there are some who will receive a reward for what they've done after they've been saved. There were others who will have loss of reward, not loss of salvation. When it's speaking about fire there, it's metaphorical. It's the fact that they are judged. This is a reference to what we call the Bema judgment of Christ. Not purgatory, not a literal fire. So do you need to undergo temporary punishment before you can be admitted to heaven? Well, Jesus spoke of a man, Lazarus, and when he died, he said the angels carried him to Abraham's side. He didn't go to some temporary place where he was immediately comforted, we are told. Before Stephen dies, he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of God, he says, waiting to receive his spirit. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He doesn't go to a temporary place. He goes straight to Jesus, who is at the right hand of the Father. No intermediate state. Because it tells us in Hebrews 9, verse 27, it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8, We are confident, I say, and we'd rather be absent from the body and present with the Lord. So when a believer dies, they don't have to go to some other place to work off unconfessed sin. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Like Lazarus carried by the angels to the side of the saints in heaven. Do you need a top-up on the redemptive work of, of Jesus? You know, top-ups, you get it with insurance, find out your insurance wasn't enough, so they try to sell you a top-up insurance to cover the gap. Is this how our salvation works? When Jesus died, it didn't quite pay the full price for our sin, so you need a top-up, you know, a bit of penance, a bit of purgatory to give you your final push into heaven. Well, when Jesus died, one of the last things he cried on a cross, in English it's rendered as, it is finished. But it's actually a single Greek word, teta lestai. Teta lestai means paid in full. It was a legal term that they actually used 
They've actually found it on legal documents where people were paying off a debt, and when it had been paid off, they would write on that bill of debt, tetelestai, paid in full. When Jesus died, your sins were paid in full. No need for a top-up. So to imply that Jesus' sacrifice won't cover all your sins is to diminish what he did in Calvary. The Bible teaches that you confess. You don't need works. You don't need arms. You don't need the prayer of others after you've died to assist, to give you a final push into heaven. If we, are conf if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just. It says, and we'll give us our sins, and that's it. So what happens if you're a Christian and you die of unconfessed sin? If you're a Protestant, <laughs> okay. Maybe you die unexpectedly and you haven't confessed every single sin. Well, we believe salvation is by faith alone and it's secured through faith in Jesus. And it, if you accept Jesus genuinely, your sins past, present and future are forgiven. We don't believe like some in eternal security that you can just keep on sinning and never lose your salvation. We believe if a person persists and carries on sinning, that ultimately they will fall away from God and they will damage their relationship. But we don't believe that every time you fall, that suddenly you're not a Christian anymore and your name gets scratched out of the book of life and then you apologize and arrive back in the book of life. That would have to have a lot of angels just assigned to that task. So ongoing confession and repentance are good for maintaining a close relationship with God, but they're not conditions for salvation. And as I said, unconfessed sin, ultimately, if you don't confess, it will affect your spiritual growth, your fellowship with God. If you persist in not confessing, you will ultimately get to the point where you can fall away. I like to use the example of David. David, to terrible sins, sins that would be actually classified as mortal. He committed adultery, and he indirectly had a man murdered. Now, more, adultery and murder are considered to be mortal sins, the ones that should send you to help. You know, when he's confronted by the prophet Nathan uh, about his sin, what he says? He writes Psalm 51. You can go read it, his Psalm of, of, of Penitence. He doesn't say, restore to me my salvation. He says, restore to me the joy of my salvation. Isn't that amazing? He hadn't lost his salvation. He said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. David had lost his joy because his relationship with God was damaged. He hadn't lost his salvation. Now, as I say, I'm not trying to tell you eternal security that you can go sin as much as you want and you'll never lose your salvation. We don't believe it. If David had persisted, as Saul did, Saul ultimately, it tells us that the Spirit of God departed from him because Saul was unrepentant and ultimately God's spirit left him. That didn't happen with David. And so I believe that a Christian who dies of unconfessed sin, it's covered by the grace of Jesus. We believe in the boundless grace and mercy of God. God's grace covers all sin, including those that are unconfessed at the time of death. Unconfessed sin, based on what we saw in Corinthians, might affect the rewards that you receive. They might be seen as building with wood, hay, or straw but not your salvation. The idea is that while salvation is secure, the quality of your rewards can be influenced by the way you conduct yourself here. And so these ideas led from one heresy to another because it was not sufficient to have the guilt of sin forgiven through absolution. We saw that you had to have penance even though that priest who's supposedly standing in on behalf of Jesus is saying, I'll give you absolution, well, you've still got to go do some penance. But then what some of the medieval theologians came up with, they said, well, you know, there's some people who live such good lives that they've actually contributed to what they call the treasury of merit. They've got so many good works and the surplus good works of Jesus. And Fortunately, the Pope had access to this treasury of surplus good works. So if you were like a bit lacking in good works, you could get an indulgence. And this indulgence would allow you to actually get some of these excess good works that were committed by other people. Okay. Nice idea. Okay. 
And first see this with the Crusades. And it wasn't linked to money, but what happened is they wanted some uh, soldiers to go fight against um, the Muslims in uh, uh, what was then Palestine because they were persecuting Christian pilgrims and basically just causing a lot of trouble. And so they wanted to go retake Jerusalem for Christianity. And one of the ways they attracted soldiers was to say, well, if you go, we'll basically give you an indulgence. Your sins will be covered for, and um, effectively you didn't have to worry about going to purgatory and all these other things because by going to the Crusades, well, you'd got an indulgence who'd paid for your sins. Join on this treasury of other people's good works. So say, very complicated theology. This is unscriptural. There's no treasury of good works from the saints. It says in Isaiah 64, verse 6, that our righteous acts are like filthy rags before God. How can the good works of men be used as a storehouse of merit? There's only merit in what Christ has done for us. And in any event, good works are no use when it comes to trying to pay the penalty of sin. Because it says in Hebrews 9.22 that without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness. There has to be a blood sacrifice. That was the teaching of the covenant theology. As with our salvation, the ongoing payment for sin is possible because of Jesus' blood. Not because of the good works of some other saints that now the Pope has given to you. Because of what you did. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Now, initially, these indulgences were granted as rewards for good deeds, like going on a crusade, but then eventually they started selling them. So it wasn't just these guys in the mega church who first had this idea, you know, that you could actually sell, you know, the gifts of God. It became a source of raising funds for building projects. So if you wanted to build a nice new cathedral, well, you could sell some indulgences. This is a great thing, and I don't have to do penance. I can actually just spend some money and buy an indulgence and get someone else's good works. And so part of the fundraising campaign by Pope Leo the, the Tenth in the 16th century was to finance the renovation of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And so there was this man, this Dominican friar, Johannes Tetzel, who started selling indulgence, indulgences in the German territory. And he was using it as a way of raising money to build or to rather refurbish this cathedral. And this was the thing that actually triggered the Reformation, which we'll look at later. This was the last straw where Martin Luther got so incensed at the fact this guy going around effectively selling forgiveness for sins. You've sinned? Well, pay me some money and you're forgiven. How did he get this right? Well, he made a deal with the ruler there. Albert, the Archbishop of Mainz, had borrowed heavily to pay for his high church rank. So remember, he had bought his rank. And he was deeply in debt. He was trying to pay off the fact that he bought uh, the, the office of Archbishop. And so he agreed to allow the sale of indulgences in territory for cut of the proceeds. So he was getting a cut as well. This was the kind of thing that was going on. Now, Peter makes it clear that redemption for sin cannot be bought with money. 1 Peter 1, 18 to 19. So if you had the Bible, you would have known it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefather, forefathers. But what? With the precious blood of Christ. A lamb without blemish or defect. The blood sacrifice is the only thing they can pay for your sins. Peter explicitly says, not with silver or gold. And the gifts of God we see in Scripture are not for sale. In Acts chapter 8, we have a case where this man, Simon, um, he's called Simon the sorcerer by some, he wants to purchase the ability to impart the Holy Spirit. He wants to buy a spiritual gift for money. Peter says to him, may your money perish with you. Because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Forgiveness, salvation is a gift. When Jesus sends out his disciples, he says, freely you have received, freely give. God's forgiveness is not for sale. It's free. 
It was free. It's free for you. But it cost the blood of Jesus. It didn't come cheap, you see, but I got it for free. Now, from one, well, I won't say bad doctrine, that's a heresy, to another. Then it was extended that not only could you buy forgiveness for your sins, you could actually buy forgiveness for someone who had already died. So now I've got my relatives in purgatory and they working off all their sins that they hadn't confessed. You could actually do them a favor by buying some indulgences and getting them out of purgatory early. So you're a pretty bad relative if you weren't prepared to do that. After all, why leave your grandfather in purgatory if you could just pay and get him out? What kind of a person are you leaving granddad in purgatory? And that's exactly what Tetzel was promoting. Now, there are some who try to deny and say, well, that was never, uh, never officially the doctrine of the church. Well, that's what Johann, Johann Tetzel, with the authority of the Pope, was going around and saying. He actually used music very effectively. And he had a famous little refrain that, if you translate it into English, because obviously he was doing it in German, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. You just drop in your money and granddad's out of purgatory. And so now, contrition, confession is no longer part of the deal. It's a simple money, a monetary transaction. Not only can I pay off my penance, I can actually do it for people who have already died, who are suffering in purgatory. And as I say, what kind of a person are you if you're going to leave all your relatives in purgatory when you could just give a contribution to build a new cathedral and get them out early? But the Bible, folks, tells us only two requirements for the remission of sin. They don't include good works, and it doesn't include the purchase of using money of someone else's credit of good works. The first is that you confess your sins to God. 1 John 1 verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. No need for penance, no need for indulgences, no need for me to go to purgatory to be punished because I haven't paid off all my sins, no need for my relatives then to have to give alms on my behalf to get me out of purgatory early. All I have to do is confess. The only other biblical requirement that we're given when we confess to our Father in heaven, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, is that you're prepared to forgive others. That's the only one I find in Scripture, one that you confess to God, and Jesus taught us to pray, our Father in heaven, forgive us our debts, or forgive us our sins, as we have forgiven our debtors. And then he goes on to say after that, that if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. That's the only biblical requirement. One, I confess to God, the other, that I'm prepared to release those who have sinned against me. There's no other requirements. No payment of money, no penance. Mark 11.25, Jesus said, When you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. You forgive others, and you then come to God and ask for forgiveness, and God has promised that as we prepare to release others their debts, he will release us of our debt to him. Then transubstantiation, big word. That was the belief that this bread and wine, when you partook of it, literally became the body and the blood of Jesus. So because it was able to take away some of your sin, just as baptism, the water literally took away your sin, so that actually literally became the body and the blood of Jesus. And in 831, there was a Frankish monk, um, Brad Burtis, who wrote a treatise on that, and he argued exactly that, that that becomes the literal body and the blood of Jesus. And appeal was made to where Jesus said, this is my body. This is my blood. There was a couple of people who were incensed at this. So as I said, I don't believe that these things were 
unchallenged. Rat Tramness and a couple of other guys, I won't tell you all their names there, they opposed him. And in fact, Retremnus, another monk, wrote a book and he explained what we believe to this day, that the bread and wine are symbolic of Christ's physical body. Because we are told that Jesus is physically in heaven, is at the right hand of the Father as a man. That's not his physical body, it represents his body. And so even though it represents Jesus' body, the elements remain bread and wine. And Jesus, in John 6, verse 63, said the words I've spoken to your spirit, when he speaks about being the bread that came down from heaven, he tells us the words I've spoken to your spirit. And that was the argument that this man, Retramnus, actually used. He said Jesus made it clear he was talking spiritually. But centuries later, this controversy flared up again. There was a man called Beringer. Um, who said that this transubstantiation was a vulgar superstition, contrary to the scriptures, he was correct, to the fathers and to reason, an absurdity, an insane folly of the populace. And this guy came under a lot of persecution, by the way. He was forced to retract what he said, but then he retracted his retraction. But at the Fourth Council of the Lateran in 1215, they said exactly that, that Jesus' a body and blood in the sacraments, under the forms of bread, have been transubstantiated. They've been changed by God's power into the literal body and blood of Jesus. And the Council of Trent took that monk that I spoke about who wrote the book, debunking it, and they put his book on the list, the Index of Prohibited Books. And eventually what that led to is that lay people weren't allowed to drink the cup. Because they were worried if you spilt it, you spill in the blood of Jesus. So they were allowed to still partake of the, the bread. But, you know, you might be clumsy and then go spill the blood of Jesus. And that's quite a serious thing to do. And so, as I say, the pill was made to when Jesus instituted this at the Last Supper. He said, this is my blood. This is my body. So isn't it correct? Isn't Jesus saying it's literally his body? Well, Jesus is speaking metaphorically, and he did it all the time. We do it as well. Um, if you use, if you know your English grammar, simile, he could have said, this is like my blood. This is like my body. A metaphor, you drop the like. And he does it all the time. They took this passage. Jesus said, I'm the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood. My flesh is real food. My blood is real drink. Because I see Jesus is telling us it's really his body. But if you look at the way that Jesus spoke elsewhere, it leads you to come to some ridiculous conclusions. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Is Jesus a light bulb? He said, I'm the gate for the sheep. Is he a piece of wood? I'm the true vine. Is Jesus a plant? I'm the living bread. He didn't mean that he was a literal loaf of bread. And so as I've told you, Jesus is using metaphors. What is he saying? He's saying, I'm like a light bulb. I'm like a gate. I'm not literally a gate. And everybody understood that. And so in the same when Jesus said, this is my body, he's not literally saying that that is his physical body. Crazy superstition. And so you see elsewhere where Jesus speaks of bread in this manner. Matthew 4, verse 4, what does Jesus say to Satan when he tempts him to eat bread? He says, man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. He speaks of the word of God as being like bread. In John 4, verse 31, where his disciples are worried, um, you know, that, 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 well, they tell him to eat something. And he says, I've got food to eat that you know nothing about. And they say, well, has someone come and feed him while we were away? Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. Now, he wasn't literally saying that that transformed into literal bread that he ate. He was saying, just as we are sustained, our physical bodies by food, so the spiritual body is sustained by the word of God. Anyone who's got a reasonable understanding of how language works 
we come to that conclusion. And when Jesus speaks in John 6, where he says, I'm the bread that comes down from heaven, there were some people who thought that that's what he was saying, and that's why they stopped following him. Because Jesus said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. And some said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And we actually told that some of his disciples deserted him. But you know what Jesus said? He said, the spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I've spoken to you are spirit. He made it clearly clear that he was speaking spiritually. Not that he was a literal loaf of bread that fell out of heaven, but that he came from heaven and was incarnated as a man. So Jesus, like his parables, was using physical concepts, eating and drinking, to teach us spiritual truth. Now you might wonder, well, what was all the fuss about? Does it really matter if someone actually believes that that's the blood of Jesus and someone doesn't believe it? Well, you know that it was so important at that time that that was one of the reasons people were burnt at the stake, because they refused to believe in transubstantiation. John Wycliffe, we call him a proto-reformer, who was before the Reformation, famous Oxford professor who translated the Bible from Latin into English. Most of that he got into a lot of trouble for. But he had a list of complaints. He didn't like indulgences, neither do we. Invocation of the saints, praying to saints, purgatory. But his chief complaint was transubstantiation. In fact, he got so incensed about it that, similar to what Luther did, he nailed a document to a door at the college where he was at with 12 of his most controversial objections. And the first was this. He said, the consecrated host, the bread, which we see upon the altar is neither Christ nor any part of Christ, but an effervacious sign of him. It's a symbol of Jesus. And so in the same way that baptism with water is a symbol. We're not literally buried. We don't literally die when we're baptized. It's a symbol that I've died and I'm now risen with Christ in the same way. What we're going to have here afterwards is just a symbol. We think of the fact that Jesus gave his real body and blood for us. And just to tell you about Wycliffe, he actually died of natural causes. They were busy fighting about who was Pope. I think there were a couple of Popes at the time, and they didn't have time to sort of deal with this troublemaker. So he died of natural causes. But um, when eventually they decided to settle down who was Pope, they were so upset with this guy, they dug him up and they burnt him at the stake. Okay. <laughs> and then they threw his body into, or the ashes into the river. We might think, well, you know, I don't think he was too bothered about that. But in those days, it was quite serious because they thought that God literally needed parts of your body to resurrect you. So if they burnt him, you know, how was God going to resurrect this poor guy? William Tyndall was executed in 1536. He was condemned, remember I told you, for heresy, um, the fact that he translated the Bible into English, but also because he rejected transubstantiation. John Frith was an English Protestant who was burned at the stake in 1533. He denied transubstantiation and was vocal about his belief. Thomas Cranmer, the Archbishop of Canterbury, he was killed by um, the queen that we've come to call Bloody Mary, Queen Mary, who killed a whole lot of Protestants at the stake. And one of the reasons was because he rejected transubstantiation. So we might think, well, it's not really a... You know, big deal if someone wants to believe that, but this is how important it was considered to be. And so we're drawing to a close here. One error leads to another. That is now the literal body and the literal blood of Jesus. So when the priest is handling it, he's actually doing the sacrifice again. Jesus has sacrificed his body on the cross, but now as the priest, if I'm handling the body and blood of Jesus, I'm making a sacrifice again. And so what came to be called the Mass wasn't the same as we think of as a church service. It was actually a re-sacrifice of Jesus' literal body and blood by the priest. And so it had the power when eaten to forgive sin. But again, just to reiterate, it's not a re-sacrifice. The Bible explicitly tells us that we've got one priest, we don't need another priest, and he sacrificed once. Why did he sacrifice once? 
Because unlike the old covenant where you had to be sacrificed because it was the blood of bulls and goats, which you are told cannot take away our sins, we are told that because he made the perfect sacrifice, he only had his sacrifice once. The idea of a repeated sacrifice is heretical. Hebrews 9 verse 12 says that Jesus did not enter, and he's talking about the temple in heaven, by means of the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most holy place, that's the temple, once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. And repeatedly in the book of Hebrews, it says that he made a sacrifice once. It was the whole idea. He put an end to the sacrificial system because his sacrifice was perfect. Hebrews 10 verse 10, by that will, we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. So it's heretical to say that Jesus' little body and blood have to be re-sacrificed repeatedly. And so the Last Supper, communion, or the Eucharist, as it's called by some, which we are going to have shortly, is a memorial to the body and the blood of Jesus. It's not the physical consumption of his body and blood. You're not re-sacrificing Jesus. He was sacrificed once for all, went into the temple in heaven, we are told, presented himself to the Father. His sacrifice was declared perfect. And because of that, the sacrificial system doesn't apply to Christians. We don't need any more priests to offer sacrifices for us. We just need a priest in heaven when we confess our sins that we commit after salvation and jesus made that clear this is my body he said given for you do this in remembrance of me it's a reminder it's a reminder of his body 1 corinthians 11 24 to 25 when he had given thanks he broke it the bread and he said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me now, in the same way, we find nothing in the old covenant that when they ate the Passover, uh, you know, lamb or they spread, uh, you know, these sort of superstitious sort of ideas that there was some sort of a, mis a mysterious transformation of bread and wine into, you know, blood and literal flesh. It's just totally against scripture. Transubstantiation is a heretical doctrine. These are symbols as is baptism. They don't literally impart grace. That grace has already been imparted when Jesus died on the cross for you. When you ask Jesus to forgive you your sins, you're forgiven then. You don't literally have to partake of this. Why do we do it? Because Jesus instructed, because he knows we are forgetful people. And he said, do this until I come. We come here to remember what Jesus has done for us and to be grateful and thank him for what he's done. So folks, with that in mind, I'm going to ask for four people to come up and assist with the bread and the wine, which is, I say, are symbols. Why are they symbols? In order to make that wine or the grape juice, as we use, those grapes have to be crushed to get that juice out there. And in the same way, Jesus was crushed. His blood was shed on Calvary. So it's a symbol of his blood. That bread is unleavened, doesn't have any yeast in it because yeast speaks of sin. It speaks of the fact that Jesus was a sinless sacrifice, but it's also broken. It reminds us of the fact that his body was broken for us on the cross. So as you partake of it, remember Jesus, who had his body broken for me, for you, who had his blood poured out, he was crushed. He was bruised for our transgression. He was crushed because of my iniquities. And we remember and we're grateful. And if you do have unconfessed sin, now's a good time to pray directly to our high priest to ask him to intercede on our behalf to, uh, to the Father. If we have any unconfessed sin, uh, this is the time where we can examine ourselves. We are told to examine ourselves as we eat the body and blood, not the literal body and blood, but these elements which remind us of that. Amen.